But as we start today's message, it's titled, Going Back to the Why. And you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes when we do something so often, it's so easy to forget the meaning of it, right? I remember for me, growing up, every morning in school, I had to do one thing, and that was the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know if you went to the school, if, if you went to the kind of the same school as I did, but every morning on the dot, they'd always make you do the Pledge of, Pledge of Allegiance. And I want to tell you something, I had good at it. I mean, I got so good, I'd be halfway asleep with my hand over my heart, to the flag, and I could, I could say it all in my sleep. But you know, I want, I want, I want to try something. Well, will, you, will you guys go with me? I want, I want to give you a test. And I want to see if your teachers were like my teachers. So what I want to do is I want to see if you know the Pledge of Allegiance as well as I do. Are you, are you up for the challenge? So, so what I want, if we, we could all stand up, if we all could stand up, and I'll start, and then I'm going to stop, and I want to hear you, you all finish. Is that okay? All right, so hand, hands over heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Amen. Terrific. You may be seated. Wow. Did we have the same teachers? <laughs> but you know, when we do so, something so often, we can do it without even thinking. And it was funny, as I was writing the sermon, I was actually going to write in the words just in case I got nervous and forgot. And I couldn't, I couldn't remember the words. But then I had to stand up and actually act like I was doing the Pledge of Allegiance, and I could do it. And you know, it's funny because I looked up the definition for the Pledge of Allegiance. I googled it. And, it, and from the Webster Dictionary it says, it means a solemn oath of allegiance and a vow of loyalty and support for the country. So every time we do the Pledge of Allegiance, we are recommitting our loyalty to our great country, America. And you know, but what's so, what's so interesting is we do it so often and I know as a child, I never thought that I was recommitting my loyalty when I was saying when I was halfway asleep. Because you see, when you do something so often, so routinely, you forget the meaning. And you know, that's what I think has happened to communion. I think we have done it so often, we've done it like a habit, it's become a routine that we've forgotten the meaning. Because if Jesus, knowing that this was going to be his last moment with his disciples, before the garden and before the cross, decided to do communion and foot washing, there has to be a bigger meaning, doesn't there? So today, my message is going to be about going back to the why we do foot washing and communion. But before we dig into the God's word, let's start with a word of prayer. My Father, Lord in heaven, God, we just want to praise you so much for giving us your one and only Son. And Lord, this morning as we go and dig into your word to discover the true meaning behind communion and foot washing, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit come into the sanctuary, come into our hearts and our minds, and may we draw closer to you this morning. We love you, Lord, and thank you so much for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. So turn with me to Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 20. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 and 20. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 And God's word says, When the hour had come, he sat down and the he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And it continues in verse 21 and 22 and 23, 23, talking about the betrayer. But here we see there are two emblems, two objects, correct? And the first one we have is the bread, and the second one, the wine, the juice. So first, let's, let's go in and let's find out what does it mean? What is the bread that we partake of? So to discover this, we're going to go to John chapter 6. Verse 48, and verse 48 to 51. John chapter 6, verses 48 to 51. And what's interesting as you're turning there, as I could find in the Bible, that the only t- part where it referenced Jesus as the bread of life is in John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, verses 48 to 51, it says, <clears throat> I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the, for the life of the world. So here we see something. In both accounts it says, this is his body, this is flesh that he's going to give on the account of the world. So what does this mean? Well, I believe there are two meanings. The first one is that, in fact, Jesus did come down from heaven, from his throne, to this dark and dreary dreary world. And I praise him for that because, you know, Jesus never had to come. He never had to be hungry. He never had to be cold. He never had to be alone. He never had to be in pain. But he did it for you and me. The second thing is that it reminds us of Jesus' suffering for us. Turn back with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 15. Because Jesus said to them, With fervent desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So as we partake of the bread, it reminds us of the suffering that Jesus went through for you and for me. And I don't know about you, but it reminds me of the Garden of Gethsemane, where our Savior, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, was on the ground with blood sweating down his face, with all the weight of the sins upon him. And you know, for the first time, Jesus was alone. Because the weight of the sins separated him from God, And his best buddies, the disciples, they were asleep. And you know, it was at this point, if you think about it, it was at this point that Jesus could have ran away. I mean, think about it. He could have ran away. His disciples were asleep. He could have ran away, got married, became a carpenter. But what did he do? Knowing what was going to happen, he said, you know, they are worth it. He says, the Cleveland First Seventh-day Adventist Church, they are worth it. He says that you and me were worth it. So knowing what was going to happen, he suffered for you and me. And go with me to Isaiah 53. And we, we probably all know this by heart, but Isaiah 53, verses 3 and 5. Isaiah 53, verses 3 and 5. And God's word says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. And surely he was borne our grief and carried our sorrows, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But, we are woun- but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement from our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Amen.
Jesus was willing to suffer for you and for me. And when we eat the bread, when we partake of communion, it reminds us that yes, Jesus came and died for us. Yes, that Jesus suffered just for you and me. But three, it's an opportunity for you and me to give our lives to Jesus, to reprioritize our life and say, you know, if Jesus was willing to do all this for me, what am I willing to do for Jesus? <clears throat> and I would like for us to go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 11. Because Paul says it better than I can. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 11. And God's word says, Yes, indeed, I also count all these things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to resurrection from the dead. My friends, when we see what Christ has done for us, everything else is rubbish. So when we partake of that communion bread, we are reminded of the suffering Jesus did for us. And when we look at all the problems of the world, just as Forrest said, when our problems are big, if we make God bigger, they become very small. And as we eat the bread, it's a time to say, God, whatever in my life you want me to do, I want to give it to you. I want to follow you. But now we have the next emblem. Go back with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And it says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my, in my blood, which is shed for you. So here, again, there are two meanings. The first one is that Jesus loved us so much that he died on a cross just for you and me. But there's a second meaning. If you look in there, it says that this cup is the new covenant. Hmm. What could that mean? Well, turn with me to Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 to 51. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 to 51. And this scene takes place as Jesus is, is on the cross. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. So here we see that new covenant begins when Jesus dies. And what is that? The veil in the sanctuary was torn. But was it from the bottom top? Top to bottom. So what does this mean? Well, during this time, if, if I sinned, I would have to go and get a lamb. And I'd have to go take it to the sanctuary for it to be sacrificed for my sin. But you see, when Jesus, the Lamb of God, died, we no longer have to do that. Praise the Lord, or we all would have <laughs> sheep in our backyard. But we no longer have to do that. But even more, something else incredibly happened. Because with Jesus, who's not only the Lamb of God, but our high priest, we no longer have to give our lamb to a high priest. But it says that we can boldly approach the throne of God. So you see, when we sin, all we have to do is say, Jesus, I am so, so sorry. And he takes our sin, he covers it with, with his blood, and it's as if it never even happened. But you see, one thing we got to be careful of is because some people try, like to try to take advantage of this. You know, they're like, well, you know, Jesus will forgive me. It doesn't matter what I do. Because Jesus will forgive me, right? 
So if I sin, you know, if I do something I'm not supposed to, it's okay, Jesus will still forgive me. But I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 and 6. Because, my friends, it doesn't work that way. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 6. And God's word says, verse 4, Hebrews, 6, chap or Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So to understand what we just read, knowing the truth, for you and I, knowing the truth, if we knowingly, willfully sin, to go back for repentance, as the Bible just said, is as if we're hanging Jesus back on the cross and putting him into open shame. And my friends, shame, shame on us. If we love our sin so much that we would crucify Jesus again. Shame on us. But you know what? That doesn't mean that if you sin, you can't go back. Because Jesus and his love, if you go with me to 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a pro propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. My, friend, no, my friends, no matter how far you go, no matter what you've done, if you go with Jesus and you give him your whole heart, He's there with open arms, and he'll bring you back. But my friends, you see, the key is that we have to go to Jesus with our whole heart. It's kind of like, you know, when, kind of the story when you have siblings, you know, and they force you to say you're sorry. Have you ever had to do that? You know, your, your little brother, and you accidentally, no, you accidentally punched them, and your, your, your mom's like, all right, honey, go say you're sorry, and you know, you, you don't really mean it. But you're like, I'm sorry. You know, if we go to Jesus like this, if our whole heart's not in it, how is Jesus expected to forgive us? But if we go to Jesus on our, on our knees and say, God, I'm so sorry, he will always take us back. And so, for, so finally, I like to, for us to, I know this is a little backwards, but I like for us to go and look and dig into the meaning of foot washing. So go with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And we're going to start with verse, <clears throat> we're going to start with verse 1. And it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. So before, I want you to notice, before Jesus um, institutes the, the foot washing, there are three things that we notice. First, that he knew his time has come. Second, he knew he was going to be betrayed. And even more, he knew who was going to betray him. And third, and this is one of my favorite things, Jesus knew that all things were given into his hands. And this, this is a sermon for another time, but what's so interesting, if you look through it, if you read Desire of Ages, through every part from the Garden of Gethsemane all the way to the cross, Jesus was in control. And that's the term for another time, but I praise the Lord that our Savior is an all-powerful Savior. There's nothing too 
too big, nothing too great for our Savior. But as we go back, <clears throat> we go back, let's read verses 4 and 5. It says, He rose from supper and led, <clears throat> and, and led him aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, there's something interesting. If you guys will go back with me one more time to Luke chapter 22, verse 24. Luke chapter 22, verse 24. Luke chapter 22, verse 24. It says, and this is right after the, the Lord's Supper, it says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Have you ever, have you ever thought of that? Right after they had the Lord's Supper. And what's so interesting is in Desire of Ages, it points to how the same spirit of who is the greatest happened right before the supper also. And it's believed that is why Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Because many scholars, many Bible, Bible scholars, <clears throat> they, they believe that since Jesus, you know, he wasn't a wealthy man. He was never, you know, with the kings or queens they believed that many times the disciples would actually had washed each other's feet. But if you notice, this time, because they're playing king of the hill, none of the disciples want to wash each other's feet. So what does Jesus do? The king of kings and lord of lords gets down on his hands and knees and washes his stubborn disciples' feet. And I want us to go back to John chapter 13. 13 verses 6 through 11 and it says then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him Lord are you washing my feet Jesus answered and said to him what I am doing you do not understand now but you will know after this Peter said to him you shall never wash my feet Jesus answered him if I do not wash your wash you you have no part of me Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my, not my feet only, but also my hands, my, my head. Jesus said to him, He who is baptized need only to wash his feet, but, but um, wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. So here we see it. Jesus is washing their feet. And Peter, being who Peter is, he's like, in that case, wash all of me. I want to be all yours. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Those who, <clears throat> what does it say? Those who have washed or who have taken a bath need only to wash their feet. And you know, what could it mean to take a bath? What could that be? What public ceremony as Christians do we do to say that we're giving our life to Jesus? <laughs> Baptism. Exactly. And what's so interesting, and I, I never really understand this, before, but there are two acts or two reasons we do foot washing. The first one is this an act of humiliation. We're taking on a place of a servant. And the second one is it's an act of cleansing. So first, let's go with the first one, the act of humiliation. Let's go back to John chapter 13, verses 12 to 17. It says, So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. My friends, if Jesus was willing to wash his stubborn disciples' feet, who am I to not want to wash my neighbor's foot? Who am I to think that I am higher and better than the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? And you see, that's why when we wash each other's feet, it is one of the best times to strengthen relationships, to mend broken ones, <clears throat> or to even create new relationships. So, today, as we do foot washing, I want to challenge you. 
If there's someone who you've had a little disagreement with, if there's someone who, you know, you just haven't been getting along, or if there's someone you just plain don't like, I want to challenge you this Sabbath to wash their feet. Because what you'll see is when you take the place of that servant, as you allow Jesus to come into your heart, he can heal all relationships. And as the body of Christ, if we can't live with each other here, how are we going to live in eternity together? The second, the second point, going to the act of cleansing, <clears throat> which is why it says if you have taken a bath, you only need to wash your feet. To understand this, we need to first understand the Jewish way of thinking. Because the Jewish way of thinking is way different than how we are today. For example, if I say I know something, you know, that can mean I either read about it or heard about it, right? So if I read about something, like, yeah, yeah, I know about it. But in the Jewish way of thinking, unless I have it, had experienced it, I didn't know about it. So Jesus, knowing that his disciples were Jews, he had them go through an act of cleansing so that they would experience literally their sins being washed in between their toes. And you know, it's funny enough that you know you and I we're not we're not as different as the Jews. I have a question for you. How many of you use one of these today? And don't, don't raise your hand. I don't want people moving in the middle of the sermon. But how many of you brush your teeth today? Well did you know and I want to share a story with you. The company called Pepsodent. Because in the 1940s, there was an epidemic. The number one complaint from the military was that their new recruits had bad hygiene. And you see, the interesting thing was, it wasn't because there's was a lack of toothpaste companies. No, there was a whole bunch of toothpaste companies. But people would buy their toothpaste, use it maybe once or twice, and then put in their covers. But then, Pepsodent came out. And all of a sudden, Toothbrushing became a daily habit. What was the secret? It wasn't their marketing, because their marketing was exactly the same as their competitors. It was their ingredients. They, used, they put two new ingredients that none of the other toothpaste did. The two ingredients were mint oil and citric acid. Now what this does is, you know when you brush your teeth, you get that minty taste in your mouth, and your breath smells a little better? Well, they added that. That's the mint oil. The second thing is they added citric acid, because you know after you brush your teeth, how you get that tingly feeling? That, they add that. And also even the foam, uh, you know when you brush your teeth and it foams? They add that too. And the reason is, is people weren't brushing their teeth because when they're done, they didn't feel like their teeth was clean. But when they added the minty taste, when they added the foaming, when they added the tingling, it made people feel like their teeth were actually being cleaned. And my friends, the same way. When we wash our feet, it is an opportunity to feel our sins being covered by Jesus' blood, to feel them being washed away. And finally, I, I want to I share a few. I'm a, I'm a visual learner, and I want to share a few a visual, a visual aid. Is that okay? So my deacons that I ask to help, and my young adults, if you, if you could start setting up, please. Because um, there's something interesting I want to share with you. The Greek word for to live is the word Para potato. Okay, and you, it, it sounds like potato, I know. But what it literally means, if you were to break down this word, is para, peri means around, okay? And potato means to walk. So literally, the way you walk around is the way you live. So you see, when, you, when you're living through life and you're walking around, sometimes your life gets dirty, doesn't it? And today, I, I want to share with you what the act of foot washing really does. Perfect. All right. Perfect. And if I could see that bag, please. Hey, thank you. All right. So here, we have, we have four basins. And you know, in life... Life can get a little sticky, can it? You know? And that, that's the way sin is. You know, like, you, you don't, you know, you don't want to do, you know, you don't want to do your sin, but it, you just seem, it just seems to stick to you. And all of a sudden, you just find yourself doing it. So that's why we got this chocolate syrup right here. And then, oh, uh, got some, 
Then we got our, our whipped cream. <laughs> our light and fluffy scents. You know? Because those little white lies, they're not, they're not that big, right? But what you see is, after a while, all those little white fluffy sins begin to add up until they start to get heavy. And even more, you know, we, we have those, those little sins, right? Those little ones. And, you know, those little sins, you know, just like waking up, not feeling like doing your devotion, or just, you know, just those little things, those bad thoughts you have in your head, all of a sudden, all of them start adding up. So, and today I asked uh, Eddie, Eddie Delay Jr. to help me. And if you don't know Eddie Delay, he is an amazing young man. If you spend some time talking with him, you can tell that he loves Jesus. And today I asked for him to help demonstrate what sin does in your life. So first, you know, you have your sticky sin, you know, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll help you here. You got that sticky sin. Uh, and then you just seem to stick to you, you know? Uh, it's just, it, you don't want to do it, but it's just, it happens, you know, you create these habits, and it's just, it just sticks to you. And then, and then after that, you have those light and fluffy ones, you know, maybe gossiping, you know, saying, <laughs> I'll help you. See, it's, a little, it's really sticky. <laughs> those light and fluffy says that, you know, they begin to add up. It just, you know, start, start creating a mess in your life. And then you have the little ones, you know, the little everyday sins that, you know, they just get in between your toes and get in between your life. And they, they you know, and at the end, you know, you look at it, and your life is a mess, isn't it? But watch this. But watch this. God created an act where you can have a friend, have a church member, get down on their hands and knees, just as Jesus did, and literally wash that sin in between their toes. Because you see, this is what happens at foot washing. And if you, if you read the meditation, and right now I'd like for you to take out your bulletin, and I'd like you to read the meditation found in your bulletin. And as you're reading it, you'll notice that during communion is a time to get your life back with God. It's a time to take the messes in your life, the sins, all the little things, all the missed opportunities, all the mercies that you know, we've overlooked, and just say, God, thank you so much. And after you've read the meditation, give me a hearty amen. 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 Is that good? This way. So this morning, if your mess looked like Eddie Jolay's feet, if your mess is a life, if your sins, you've been trying to beat your sins, but your sins are beating you, if you wandered away from God, if maybe your flame, your spiritual flame is starting to die, I want to welcome you. I want to invite you to partake in our communion service. Because this is a time for us to get our lives right with God. Because my friends, I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And there's no time to be away from God. Every day when you be there right by Him. So after I pray, we're going to start our communion service. If you, you, we will all go into the FLC, the gym, and there you'll see different sections. There's couples there for the married couples, and then there's women, which is divided by mats, and then there's men. And I'd just like to invite you right now, as after a prayer, to go over there, to wash your feet, to, to meet with somebody. If you don't have anybody wash your feet, let me know. I'd love to either get, to, to find someone for you, or I would love to wash your feet. Because right now is a moment, is a time, to give our whole lives to Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Dear my Father, Lord, our God, Lord, we praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the price and the suffering he paid just for us. 
Lord God, we pray that this morning that we'll give our whole hearts to you. Let there be no sin in between our toes, Lord, but may we be pure and holy in your sight. We love you, Lord, and thank you so much for loving us. In your name I pray, amen.